here's a pop quiz for you. 600,000 Americans get surgery on this body part every single year. Which of the following three is it? It's the feet. And the cause? Shoes. You're a shoe! About the shoes. Yes, shoes. I know this is probably gonna sound a little bit crazy at first, but I wanna tell you all about the false claims, the misleading marketing, and the straight up lies that the footwear industry feeds us every single day through their marketing. Pointy, dainty, colorful, sparkly, oof. They have the power to convey confidence, status, sexiness, and of course, they're the perfect complement to a killer outfit. Now, don't get me wrong, I used to love shoes, like really love. In fact, I used to collect really cute pairs of shoes like heels and moccasins. I had shoes from Prada and Burberry and all kinds of small, unique designers. They were like a symbol of power to me and they made me feel so sexy and well-groomed. But there's a darker side to the shoe industry that few people ever find out about. All right, let's dig in. Shoes are a huge part of the fashion industry. And as we know, fashion trends are set by people in power and the ruling class. You've probably heard of the Chinese practice of foot binding. Foot binding was customary for almost 800 years in China. It involved tightly wrapping the feet of young girls to prevent them from growing. At the time, if you didn't have tiny bound feet, you weren't considered a very good marriage prospect or well brought up. And while this may seem horrific to us today, soon you'll see that it's not too far off from what we do to our feet today. What about you, huh? Where are your shoes? Where are your shoes, huh? <laughs> Heels have also been popular throughout the ages. Although the stiletto heel wasn't invented until 1955, yes, that's less than 70 years ago, it was actually the Romans who were the first to use an elevated heel. After that, heels for women and men continued to be in fashion well into the 1800s. Here's a fun fact you can share with your friends at dinner parties. Back in the day, in Venice, wealthy women would wear heels to protect their feet from the trash, waste and muck that lined the Venetian city streets at the time. Rich people things. <laughs> and throughout most of human history, all of our ancestors wore these very simple shoes, basically kind of like sandals, made out of hemp and fiber and various kinds of natural materials. They were practical, right? Very straightforward, just a simple tool, and they allowed for humans to move across the world without injuring themselves too much. In the summers, like, like, we just never had shoes on. This is Adelia. She is a barefoot endurance athlete and she was brought up barefoot. When I was like maybe seven or eight, my dad decided that since we didn't wear shoes, he would... <laughs> I can't believe we did this, but I love it. Um, we cut out like the shape of our feet onto an old tire uh, mold and took twine and just intertwined it and then wrapped it like a sandal around our ankles. So not formal shoes, but you, it, we counted it as shoes. Yeah, I mean, it's, I guess at that point, it's, it was like what the shoe was always meant to be, which is a way to protect your foot from yeah. the elements. Today, the global footwear market is estimated to be worth almost 382 billion US dollars, and it spends almost 800 million dollars a year on advertising. When you look at shoe ads today, it's hard to see the simple practical tool we once used. Instead, we see the life we could have if only we owned the pair of shoes to do it in. And the shoe companies know it. The founder of Nike, Phil Knight, once admitted that the marketing of a shoe is much more important than the making of a shoe. He told the Harvard Business Review, For years we thought of ourselves as a production-oriented company, meaning we put all of our emphasis on designing and manufacturing the product. But now, we understand that the most important thing we do is market the product. And market they do. Okay, so imagine you're in the market to buy a new pair of sneakers. It's really, really confusing. It's nitrogen infused. A DNA loft. They have added a TPU heel clip. 3D printed lattice midsole structure. The current fashion is maximalist running shoes, which are being advertised as the solution to all running problems. They usually have super thick soles, loads of cushioning and so-called protection. The companies that make these shoes claim that they lead to a softer strike, so they're being marketed as shoes that lead to fewer injuries. Turns out, this is pure marketing with no empirical backing. In fact, science suggests that these shoes actually increase the risk of injury. 
Take this 2018 study published in the highly respected scientific journal Nature. It studied a group of experienced runners and compared their running style in both highly cushioned and less cushioned shoes. What the researchers found was that all those claims about highly cushioned shoes reducing the risk of injury actually seemed to be false. Because it's exactly the cushioning that's the problem. It's kind of like, you know, a warm bun drowning in butter or like a helicopter parent never letting their kid explore their own full potential. A lot of the research that was done originally when cushioned footwear came out actually pointed out all the flaws in it. This is Ben Levicant from Vivo Barefoot. He has coached over a thousand runners and examined a lot of feet. If anybody can help you keep your feet healthy, is this guy. Further research that's been done kind of shows that cushioning ultimately has the opposite effect than it's meant to, in that it's tricking you into thinking that you're walking on a, on a softer surface. And by doing that, you walk with stiffer legs, which increases the impact forces rather than decreasing them. You tend to take a longer stride and actually walk at a faster speed, but because you're walking at a faster speed with a longer stride, you're taking less steps and that's increasing the impact forces. Our feet are powerful tools perfected through millions of years of evolution. I think it's because feet have become like a fashion item almost. Let me introduce you to Anna McNuff. She does not see herself as a barefoot evangelist, so to speak, but she did run the length of Britain completely barefoot over 2,000 miles without shoes. We put them in pointy shoes, we stick them in, in high heels, and they become um, almost something to put on a, a front to the rest of the world that we're a certain way, you know? And, and um, yeah, and that's what I think about about shoes. That's why I used to, I mean, I, I'm, I can't walk in high heels anyway, and I used to hate wearing them on nights out when I felt like I sort of had to, because that's just what you wore. Um, and I'd always say, you'd always end up walking home barefoot anyway. That everyone does. So yeah. I think they have become this. For a lot of people, it's become yeah, a, almost like yeah, like a fashionable thing. So if you, if they're ugly, don't get them out. But I don't even know what ugly means. But people have yeah. this own perception of what ugly and it. And and we've lost. We've lost, I think, the, the realization that they're the functional. 25% of all the bones in your body are in your feet. They have 52 bones, 68 joints, 214 ligaments, 38 muscles, 8,000 nerves, and a quarter of a million sweat glands. They enable the average human today to walk 100,000 miles in their lifetime. And we lead pretty sedentary lives, so imagine what these babies would have done for your ancestors in the distant past. The point is, feet are nature's masterpiece. They're not supposed to be smothered in all that gooey warm butter. They are supposed to be let free, strong and powerful. But we are the problem. We are the ones that weaken our feet. We lock them inside these little foot coffins for decades on end, squishing them and tightening them and constraining them into a shape that is not a natural shape for your feet. Because shoes are not foot shaped, they're actually shoe shaped. If you restrict natural strength and natural movement for so long, they will eventually go away. Called out and said, please, if there's research that you've got on, on cushioning to show cushioning is fantastic, please send it to us. Um, there isn't any. It's smoke and mirrors. So I started noticing that like my feet would go numb or like the uh, inner side of my knee. I don't know what that's called, but like inside my knee started to hurt and then wow. I'd go to bed and like my back would hurt, like my lower back. And I was like, what is happening? And I figured it out, like, so this is embarrassing. It was like a few years ago that I figured it out because whatever, like basically anytime I'd wear those boots, because I don't have a lot of shoes, I actually have like two pairs and it's those and then my barefoot shoes. Yeah. Um, when I'd wear those, I'd be in pain. And I was like, oh, this is not for me because my feet, my body, like it's so connected head to toe. If you are like flat footed or if you are, um, if your toes are spread out and then you suddenly put a like a heel or if you suddenly like restrain your toes that will affect all the way up all the way up your body so let's get this straight for a second shoes are making our feet deformed 600,000 Americans need foot surgery every single year we're spending more money than ever on shoes 100 billion dollars in the United States alone last year I spent 
$40,000 on shoes and I have no place to live? Is there anything that's actually good about shoes? This is the exact question that I started to myself when I started going down this rabbit hole. So I kind of decided to try going barefoot for a while and see how that would feel. So I've been mostly barefoot for about a year and I've done a lot of things barefoot. I mean, I started out by just kind of like walking barefoot on, you know, it's like soft soil and ground and sand. And then I progressed slowly onto gravel and little rocks and then concrete. I've been barefoot in Starbucks, in restaurants, in cities. I've been barefoot on a freaking flight. I took a flight barefoot. Nobody told me off and nobody seemed to care. But I'm also a runner, right? So I didn't immediately start running completely barefoot because I feel I felt like that would be just too much. So I started using these minimalist running shoes that have like a zero heel drop. So like a perfectly flat sole. And they also have no cushioning and like a wide toe box. So honestly, after like a month of kind of getting used to it, I just started noticing that my ankles were becoming stronger while running. My feet were becoming stronger and also a bit wider and just more muscular. I felt way more balanced than before, but also like really interestingly, I felt super grounded. I felt connected to like the soil beneath my feet for the first time ever. And that was a really beautiful feeling. I found like a, I felt like I found a new spark in running. I've run two ultra marathons since going barefoot and I've had no pain and no injuries, no tension even in my feet or legs or body, <laughs> despite training very, very hard. So what gave you the idea to run the length of Britain barefoot? Oh, that's a good story. Well, it started when I, I read the book, um, you know, Born to Run, and um, I did what loads of people did probably after reading that book, went out, bought, my, bought myself some minimalist shoes, went for a 10k run, absolutely smashed my calves to bits, felt like an <laughs> idiot, couldn't walk for three weeks. And then, you know, the, the, the fad kind of died away and I went back to wearing slightly more supported shoes. I was thinking about doing a new adventure and I wanted to do it in Britain, in Britain because of my uh, connection with um, the Girl Guiding Charity and Young Women. And I thought, okay, I think it's going to be a run. It has to be a run. It's going to be in Britain. And then I just thought, how can I make it more difficult than just doing it in trainers? Because um, it sounds really arrogant, but I knew I could do it in trainers. I, mm. I, and, you know, you, you must get yeah. that. You, there, there's not that buzz there. If you know you can do it, it's great, mm. but it, you want to be right on that edge, that knife edge, where you think you're, you know, half 50% terrified, 50% excited. Yeah. And and I thought, there's this crazy little voice in my head said, well, why don't you just do it in bare feet? And straight away, when you, you absolutely cannot do that. That's insane. So that's where it started. And um, I had a long lead up to it. I think I decided on the adventure a good three years before I actually did it. And then it was a wow. year and a half of training of course it hasn't been all rainbows and butterflies like for example i did get kicked out of starbucks when i went in barefoot in oregon in the us which kind of sucks and here's another really important thing i'm not saying that going barefoot is going to solve all of your physical issues of course not in fact if you have serious problems with your feet then perhaps shoes very specific types of shoes are exactly what you need I don't know, go speak to a doctor. But let me just put this out there. The vast majority of the human population is born with perfectly healthy feet. The reason why so many of us suffer from foot problems is because of long-term lifestyle and footwear choices. So what on earth do we do about it? <laughs> you know, like I've been barefoot for a year, but I do appreciate the fact that most of you who are watching this video probably live in cities and you go to offices and supermarkets and just going wild and feral and barefoot is probably not going to cut it. <laughs> so I'm not going to suggest that. Don't worry. When I did the barefoot run, I think everyone expected me to be a barefoot evangelist. Mm -hmm. I, I like They expected me to say, you must be barefoot. Everyone should be barefoot. This is the only way. And my point of view, actually, by the end of it was I choose to be barefoot as often as I can or in minimalist shoes because that's yeah. what suits me and makes me feel good and my body. But 
I think that everyone should have the choice. And I think all that happens is the only choices we see are like these, you know, this tiny narrow spectrum of if you've got an issue, you must go more supported. No one goes, what about less support? Or what about yeah. fixing all these other issues in your body rather than just cramming your toes in? It's okay. Like where you're at is okay. And I, I like always try to welcome people into my space of like, just come as you are, be as you are. I'm Adelia who sleeps on the floor and I don't wear shoes. Like I'm, <laughs> this is just me. But I invite people and I encourage people into like pursuing that little bit of naturalness. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't have to be the zero or a hundred. It doesn't have to be um, like I'm all in or I'm all out. Like yeah, like you said, just a little bit here and there. Yeah, even just that little bit of a start is just really good for whatever piece of your life that maybe needs some peace and some naturalness and some beauty. Those little pieces they all interconnect. So personally, I would definitely recommend having a think about trying out minimalist footwear. And I know like this is weird because I feel like I'm like marketing for minimalist footwear, kind of like what the big shoe industry is doing with their cushioned shoes. But this video is not sponsored by anyone and I'm just speaking from my own personal experience. I would definitely recommend trying out minimalist footwear, see if it's for you. It does take a few months for your feet to kind of get used to the new and like relaxed fit. So make sure that the transition is slow and gradual over the course of a few months. Just remember that if you do really like them and if you end up wearing them a lot, then your feet may no longer fit into your old Prada heels or whatever other cute shoes. Whatever you decide to do, I suppose my hope for this video was to show a different side to the story because footwear is such a huge segment of the fashion industry today and the fashion industry quite literally runs the world. It is so huge, so important, so powerful. So I just feel like it's always interesting to know these industry quirks, you know, and how they affect us and our lives. And as for me and my secret hopes and desires, hmm, I would love to one day run an ultra marathon barefoot. Oh yeah, and there's plenty of links to various studies and articles and other really, really good videos about the subject in the description box below. So make sure you check that out and I will see you in the next video. Go barefoot!